Tonight is part of my talk, my Dvar Torah. I want to talk about Sheik Jara. And if you have been anywhere near the news these past two weeks, you know that I am referring to a neighborhood in East Jerusalem, which may have been one of the triggers for the 11-day bombing exchange between Hamas in Gaza and Tzahal, the Israeli Defense Forces. I want to talk about Sheikh Jarrah because in the extremely complex situation of the Middle East, in the even more complex conflict between Jews and Arabs that has now lasted for over 150 years, 150 years, Sheikh Jarrah offers itself to us as a multi-dimensional facet of the a paragon that is the Middle East. Sheikh Jara is the name of an Arab neighborhood in Jerusalem that was first developed as a residence area outside of the walls of the old city in the second half of the 19th century. At the time, Jerusalem and all the land around it were just a remote backward province of the Ottoman Empire to which the Sultan in Istanbul, besides maintaining somewhat the Muslim holy sites, did not pay too much attention to or invested much effort or money to maintain. Today, Palestinians claim the area derives its name from Sheikh Jarrah, who was a physician to Saladin, the Islamic military leader who fought the Crusaders in the 12th century at a time when European Christians own that land again. His body, Sheikh Jara, his body is believed to be buried there. I said on that land again because since the fall of the Second Temple of Jerusalem in 70 CE, ownership of that land has gone from the Romans to the Byzantine Christians to various Muslim caliphates to Christians again after the Crusades to the Mamluk Caliphate to the Ottoman Empire and until 1948 to the British Mandate. The Hebrew University of Jerusalem, those of you who have traveled to Israel with me have visited the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, one of the um, places that I lived where I lived and attended, which sits on Mount Scopus. And Mount Scopus is literally in the adjoining neighborhood from Sheikh Jara. The adjoining neighborhood from Sheikh Jara. Now, I remember when I was a student there at the university that you could either catch bus number nine from downtown Jerusalem to go to the Hebrew U, 
which would drive, the bus would drive on the outskirt of Shikjara, getting up the hill to the university. But if you caught the number 23 bus instead, you would actually drive past Damascus Gate, meander your way through several Arab neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, including Sheikh Jarrah, just before reaching the university. Oftentimes, you know, when we, when we hear East Jerusalem, many of us conjure up images of maybe remote Arab villages or picture the Arab quarters of the old city, but Sheikh Jarrah was outside like I mentioned, of the walls of the old city. Sheikh Jarrah would be to Mount Scopus, for those of us who are, live in Seattle, what first hill would be to Capitol Hill. Adjacent city neighborhoods. When the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood was developed in the 1800s, it was extremely dangerous at the time for everyone to live outside the protection of the old city walls. But it was decided anyways for this and other little neighborhoods to be built because it was a solution to the overcrowding and insanitary conditions that had developed within the walls where Jews, Christians, and Muslims had lived together for hundreds of years, like they had, you know, in Tzfat, in Tiberias, or in other places in the land. Now, what else happened in the second half of the 1800s as this neighborhood was developed? As over many centuries, but especially in the 1800s, a trickle of Jewish families here and there were moving back to the Promised Land. Many of them fleeing poverty, but most of them fleeing anti-Semitic violence um, all around Europe, to be honest, but especially the pogroms of Eastern Europe, the massacres of the villages uh, Jewish villages and shtetls in Eastern Europe. The first big wave of Eastern European Jewish immigration fleeing the disastrous, bloody, um, deadly policies of Tsar Alexander III, that big wave of Jews arrived after 1881 in search of a home, a peaceful place to set roots away from danger. In 1875, which is several years before that major wave of immigration from Eastern Europe, a group of Ashkenazi and Sephardi families purchased the land of Sheikh Jarrah in all probability because it had religious significance to Jews since it housed the tomb of Shimon HaTzadik, one of the great uh, sages of our tradition, Simon the Just. And they purchased they purchased in 1875 that tract of land like Jews did all throughout the 1800s and until World War I from its owner at the time, the owner of that land at the time, the Ottoman Empire and the Sultan in Istanbul. Now, once it was purchased by those Jewish families, the property was registered in the Ottoman land registry as a trust under the name of Rabbis Avraham Ashkenazi, 
Sephardi Jews actually had some time less as a last name Ashkenazi, go figure, and Meir Auerbach. Every piece of land that Jews acquired through World War I and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the time, they bought from the owner at the time, they bought from the Sultan in Istanbul. And believe me, it wasn't, it was never an easy thing to do. It took a lot of diplomacy and and, 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 and leaders in the Jewish community to go to Istanbul um, in order for the purchase to go through. Now, Jews and Muslims lived peacefully in Sheikh Jarrah until 1948. From 1875 to 1948, almost 75 years. Now, on the 14th of May, 1948, at 4 p.m., David Ben-Gurion proclaimed the independence of the State of Israel based on the UN resolution, which just month before had proposed a two-state solution for Jews and Palestinians to live side by side in the land. David Ben-Gurion and the Jews um, adopted the UN uh, two-state solution, adopted the plan. The Arabs, the Palestinians, rejected it. By the time the sun rose the morning after Ben-Gurion's proclamation, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Egypt, and the newborn Palestine all together attacked the hours old Israel to erase it from the map before it could ever exist. A war ensued that lasted for a year and at the end of that year the Israelis were victorious. Egypt still occupied the Gaza Strip and Jordan now occupied the area now known as and referred to to this day as the West Bank because it's the bank west of the Jordan River including East Jerusalem of course and therefore the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. The state of Palestine was lost to the Palestinians having lost the war. Jordan and Egypt never even considered between 1948 and 1967 re-establishing a Palestinian state in the land that they themselves had conquered. Jordan forcibly evicted all the Jewish families that came under its rule, just as Israel forcibly and sometimes violently evicted the Palestinian families from the areas they conquered through the war. Not all. Some Palestinian families decided to remain in place, but most often very violently, very sometimes with great bloodshed, um, Palestinian families were ejected from their ancestral holdings as a consequence of the war. Jordan did the same with all the Jewish families that remained in under their control, including the families of Sheikh Jarrah. At that point, uh, there was a custodianship of the property that was transferred to the Jordanian 
Custodian of Enemy Properties Agency. That was the name of that agency under Jordan government. It was called the Jordanian Custodian of Enemy Properties Agency. It's interesting that they use the word enemy because this territory never was, uh, at that point, was not uh, ever had been in uh, Jewish hands. Uh, nonetheless, they called it the Enemy Properties Agency. In 1956, eight years, seven, eight years after the end of the war, the Jordanian government leased those properties to 28 families of Palestinians displaced, as I mentioned, by the war, while the Jordanian government Right, they leased the properties while the Jordanian government retained full ownership of the properties themselves. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to draw a picture of how complex and convoluted all of this is. And I'm, I'm hoping that just by tracing, by tracing the, the history of it, we, we can begin to have a sense how, of how challenging all of this really is. I'm not done. <laughs> because after the Six Day War in 1967, when Israel gained control of Jerusalem, Israel passed a law allowing Jews whose families were evicted by Jordanian or British authorities in the city prior to 1967 to reclaim their property, provided they could demonstrate proof of ownership and the existing residents were unable to provide such a proof of purchase or of legal transfer of title. And it is based on this law that legal proceedings were entered into back in 1982 in Israel for these families, the Jewish family, to reclaim their property. That started in 1982. And until now, lawsuit after lawsuit, appeal after appeal, obviously the Israeli courts have always ruled in, fa in favor of the Palestinian residents. Always since 1982. Now, eventually, the last round of, uh, of legal action went all the way to the Israeli Supreme Court, which postponed its ruling a couple weeks ago in view of growing tensions in Jerusalem prior to Hamas beginning to fire at Israel. And that's the story of Sheikh Jara, a little neighborhood in East Jerusalem at the border with West Jerusalem. It's, it's an amazing story, and I love that story because it captures in just one example, right? Multiply that almost to infinity, and you kind of understand the, 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 the incredible challenge of, of, of that situation between, between Israelis and Palestinians. But just not just that, the whole conflagration of the Middle East as well. You, can't, you can never isolate the conflict to just the Palestinians and the Israeli people. It, it includes all the nations around as well. Now to go back to our to our little example that is so telling of the entire process, the entire conflagration, obviously at this point the legalities of the case have been co-opted by politics. And the reality is that the right-wing, disastrous rule of Netanyahu, of Benjamin Netanyahu over Israel this past 12 years, 
12 years have done nothing to promote peace. Nothing to promote peace. Quite the opposite. Netanyahu and his many government of all 12 years have in fact further and further alienated the Palestinian people in part by continuous land grab and also by the spread of illegal settlement in, um, in the West Bank all in, um, as obstacles really to uh, a final uh, treaty, a final peace agreement, the possibility even of a peace agreement between the two nations. Adding time after time with every settlement more oil to the fire, more obvious resentment from the Palestinians. And so politically, Shikjara is in fact the continuation of such policies. Not legally, legally is one thing, but politically it is in fact the continuation of such policies. To gnaw at, to chip at the sovereignty of the Palestinian land. And all who care about peace must oppose these kinds of policies. Period. But Sheikh Jara, like I said, is an example of how complicated everything is in the Middle East. And so those who try to paint so easily, it seems, a, a black and white portrait of the situation there, those who we've seen this past two weeks spread Hamas propaganda around social media, or those who on the other side spread religious fanatic Jewish propaganda of the great Israel uh, that includes somehow, that should include the, the Palestinian territories, all of those who are engaging in such extreme, one-sided, which the situation can never be looked at from one perspective, are contributing to demonizing and dehumanizing one group over another. And in doing so, they are only hurting, hurting the people on the ground. They are only further radicalizing each side. And when each side, each side grows further and further radicalized, when we are so far away from each other, more and more people die. More and more people die. I've been watching the, tr the, the, the horrendous Hamas propaganda and my heart cries because people think they are embracing the Palestinian cause by sharing this, but in fact they are hurting they're, they're strengthening perhaps the resolve of a terrorist organization like the Hamas, but they are hurting the Palestinian people because they are pushing everyone so far to the extreme that we are losing the ground for peace. And peace, peace between the peoples of Israel and Palestine is what we should all pursue and all work toward blindly taking one side, one side, as if that was possible, attacking and vilifying the other, will never get anyone to the peace negotiating table. It will foster more violence and it will cause the loss of more innocent lives that we must decry.
I've been watching a lot of Israeli TV and Israeli news, as you can Im imagine. And time after time, watching the Israeli commentators, and they are Jews and Arabs together working in every news channel in Israel. But they were all saying that we, they, all of us, must realize and really understand that the Israeli people are not going anywhere. We must understand and realize as well that the Palestinian people are not going anywhere either. At the end of the day, they will have to find a way to live together peacefully, securely, and sustainably on that piece of land. And if we have, we who live far away, have any role to play, it's not to add oil to that fire. It's not, it's not to take one position over another. It is to take, if we were to take one side, would be maybe a third side, the, the side of those, the millions upon millions of Palestinians and, and Israeli people, everyday people who are yearning for peace, who are yearning for prosperity, who are yearning to live life without fear. That is, if we're going to take any side, the side we must take. Because there is no other viable choice. There is no other viable choice. So please, understand the infinite complexity of what is unfolding in the Middle East. Don't be pulled into simplified narrative that make believe they know the truth, that try to defend or protect or justify what can be neither promoted nor justified, which is more hatred towards the other. It's only the innocent, the children, the mothers, who are betrayed by their leaders and pay with their life and it is them that we must join in solidarity for peace. Can you hear that song?